Our sermon series about meeting Jesus is introducing us to characters, figures in the New Testament, the Gospels, who encounter Jesus in some way and have their lives changed. This Sunday, we hear the story of a father. But this text is interesting because it tells the story of a father, the head of the synagogue named Jairus, whose daughter is sick, but this story is interrupted by another story of a woman who's been suffering. And then we pick back up the story of Jairus. And these two stories are woven together for a reason. There's a sense to, to why Mark interrupts his story of Jairus with the story of the woman. And we'll see that as we, as we listen. Mark chapter 5. Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him and all the people followed, crowding around him, a woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask, Who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, Your daughter is dead. There is no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, Don't be afraid, just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, Why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead, she's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying, and the girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened, and then he told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. We meet a loving father this morning, and this loving father meets Jesus, and I know now that I'm a father, that a father will do anything for his children, anything to keep them safe, anything to help them, to give them what they need. But I also know that there comes a point in a human father's life where they realize they can't help their child. The first time you drop off your child at school and you're not there to make sure everything goes well. We reach limits as a human father where we realize that our children need Jesus more than they need us. Jairus reaches this limit with his daughter. He can't help her. And so he comes to Jesus. He brings himself and his daughter to Jesus and asks for his help. 
That's what we're going to talk about that, that today. What does it mean to bring our children to Jesus, to ask for Jesus to watch over, to protect, to heal our children? There are two reasons that people come back to church after an extended absence. And they're this. Next slide. Having children and personal tragedy. Those are the two main reasons that people come to church after they've been away. And it's interesting that these are the two reasons put together that Jairus comes to Jesus. He comes for his child and because there's a tragedy. And you know how this story goes, though, for most people. Let's take a, a typical male. A boy grows up in the church. His family makes him come to church. And then sometime in high school, usually, maybe in college, church stops being really interesting, and the young man stops going. He's more interested in building his career and meeting girls. Now, that's ironic and a little bit sad because choosing your career and choosing who you'll marry are two of the most important decisions you'll make in your life. And doing that away from your church and your faith tradition isn't all that wise. But young men are young men. They'd rather chase beauty and money on their own, and most of them do. But then, then they get married they get their career, they get settled, and then they have children, and they look back on all of the things that they did in high school and college and think, oh my God, I better get my kid to church. And if that little child is a boy, they raise him in the church, and the cycle repeats. That's usually how it goes, isn't it? But in, in addition to the sort of the oversight of making that period of your 20s when you decide the course of your life, a time when you're away from church, there's another oversight here, which is that when, sometimes when we bring our children to church because we look at all those things we used to do and we're terrified, we forget that actually we need the church just as much as our children maybe even more. I, I was reading an article the other day about a, a Jewish man who was talking about his synagogue, and his synagogue was declining, shrinking in membership and participation. And he wrote this article about why he thinks that is, and he said something that really surprised me. He said, he said this, he said, we made synagogues so child-focused that many Jews could not see beyond that. When their last child graduates from high school, many Jews say to themselves, who needs this anymore? See, if we, if we come back to church only for our children and not for ourselves, when our children are done, when they're moved out, what's the point? It's my job as your pastor to insist that I don't care how old you are, I don't care how many years you went to Sunday school, you need church just as much, maybe more, than your children. Jairus has to come to Jesus himself if he wants his daughter healed. Jairus has to come to Jesus and look him in the eye if he wants to save his daughter. And this is not just some kind of inward spiritual truth, although it is that. If you want your children to know Jesus, you better know him. But it's a statistical truth. It's an objective fact. The number one predictor of a child's faith is the faith of the parent. And I don't, I don't mean faith in the sense, well, in your head. Yeah, I believe in God. Okay, I have faith. No, faith as a predictor of the child's faith means not just do you think in your head there's a God, but do you worship? Do you study your Bible? Do you pray? Do you serve? Do you live your faith? That's the predictor. If you want your children, you have to come yourself. 
everyone wants Jesus to look out for their kids. Everyone would like Jesus to send an angel to watch over them. But not everyone is willing to come before Jesus and look him in the eye. And Jairus is. These two things, having children and a personal tragedy, come together in Jairus' life and drive him to Jesus. And that second reason, tragedy, though, for many people, that's actually a fork in the road. Or for some people, a tragedy draws them to Jesus, doesn't it? Something goes wrong, something happens in your life, and, and you suddenly are aware that maybe you can't do it all alone. But just as often, sometimes more often, a tragedy can drive someone away from God. And you probably know people like this. Something awful happens, and they think, I can't reconcile this suffering, this evil, with God. And so they stop believing, they turn away, they fall out of church. And we shouldn't judge anybody because we don't know how we would respond if something like that happened to us. We might be moved to turn away. And I can't tell you, I don't think anyone can, why children suffer, why there's evil in the world. But this scripture can tell us something about God's relationship to suffering. How is God related to evil and suffering? And that's what drives our interlude where the woman comes to Jesus. And the woman who's been bleeding for 12 years comes to Jesus and according to biblical code, to cleanliness and purity law, she's unclean. And it's against the law for something unclean to touch something holy. And these cleanliness and purity laws, they weren't meant to be cruel to this poor woman. They were meant to protect the holiness of God. They were meant to express what John says, that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. God is life and holiness and perfection, and he has nothing to do with darkness and corruption and suffering. God's nature is pure and holy and antithetical to anything wrong or corrupt or impure. And so these laws taught Israel that God is pure light. But this woman has faith, and her faith means that she will risk touching the holy, not knowing what will happen. How will, the whole, how will the incorruptible react to touching what is unclean? But she has faith. She touches Jesus and she's healed. And this tells us that though God is antithetical to suffering and corruption, He will touch it. And when God touches what is broken, what is corrupt, he heals and he restores it. And this is what brings these two stories together. If you read Leviticus or uh, Deuteronomy, next slide, uh, sorry, Numbers chapter 19, it's also forbidden for something to touch, a, for something holy to touch a corpse. Numbers 19 says, whoever touches a human corpse will be unclean for seven days. So this idea of purity, of God's separation from what's impure runs through both of these stories and it's what connects them together. A corpse is also unclean, just as a woman who's been bleeding is unclean. But notice what happens. In verse 41, this is a different translation. This is from the NIV. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. Jesus touches the hand of a corpse. He holds the hand of the little girl who has died and says, get up. God will break his own rules to restore life, to heal. That's what this tells us. So, I don't know why there's suffering. I don't know why children die. I don't know why there's evil. But I know that God hates suffering. 
Suffering and death are God's enemy. They are not his tools. They are not his will. That's what I can tell you. What is the relationship of God to evil and suffering? He hates them. They are his enemies and he defeats them. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, for Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. That's what Jesus is showing us in both of these stories, that he has come to conquer suffering, to conquer death. They are not his tools. They are not his will. They are his enemy. I don't know where they came from, but I know their fate. And their fate is to meet Jesus and be defeated. When I was still in seminary, I worked as a chaplain as part of my seminary education in a hospital at Arcadia Methodist Hospital near Pasadena in Southern California. And one night I was on call and I was called to the emergency room because a little girl, two years old, was arriving by ambulance who had choked on a grape. Her mother had stepped away to use the restroom and she'd put a grape in her mouth and choked. Her mom tried to clear her airway and couldn't, called 911. The paramedics worked on this little two-year-old girl the whole way to the hospital, but by the time she arrived, it was too late. Now, they hadn't told the parents yet that the little girl didn't make it, and I was called, and I was there, and I watched their faces as the doctors told them her little, that their little girl was gone. We took the little girl downstairs into the basement chapel to give the family some time to say goodbye and to pray. And when the family went home after a couple of hours, I waited in that room alone with a two-year-old little girl before transport came to take her to the morgue. I'll never forget what she looked like. So small, so pretty, but pale and still. I was angry at God. And I said to God that night, you better answer for this. But I'm standing here still preaching because I believe that Jesus hates the death of that little girl even more than I do. I don't know why there's evil. And I don't know why things like that happen. I don't know why little girls choke on grapes. But I know how God responds. God heals the sick. He raises the dead. He brings life out of death. He conquers his enemies. God does not stay safe and protected from what's broken, but he touches it. He will break his own rules to touch suffering and death, and he will transform it. I don't know when this will happen for you or for what's on your heart this morning. But again, I wouldn't be here after that night with that little girl if I didn't believe what Paul says, that every enemy, every enemy will be defeated and placed under the feet of Jesus. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you that you do not stay separate from your enemies, but you meet them. You touch what is unclean. You hold the hands of the dead. And you raise the dead and you heal the sick. Lord, I pray that the day would come when all your enemies are vanquished at your feet. I pray that each of us would have the faith of Jairus, not just to bring our children to you, but to meet you ourself. Because you are the God that delivers us. When our powers, when our abilities, when our money, when our protection, when our comfort runs out, you are our only hope. 
and you are faithful. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us.